Hi, I'm Martha Grogan, a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And today we'll review uh, cardiac amyloidosis, what every cardiologist needs to know. I have no disclosures pertinent to this presentation. So amyloidosis is really a fascinating disorder of protein misfolding. And there are over 20 different um, proteins that can form amyloid fibrils, but fortunately for us as cardiologists, only three of those really uh, uh, deposit in the heart. So we'll review the three most important types of amyloidosis that can uh, cause cardiac involvement. AL, uh, previously called primary systemic amyloidosis, is a disorder of monoclonal light chains uh, due to a plasma cell disorder. So the um, proteins are produced in the bone marrow. Familial amyloidosis is due to mutations in the transthyretin uh, protein, and that's made in the liver, and the unstable mutant version of this protein deposits to form uh, amyloid fibrils in the tissues and organs. And senile cardiac amyloidosis is also due to transthyretin uh, deposition, but in this case, there's no mutation and the molecule is actually uh, structurally normal, but for reasons that really aren't uh, clear, it deposits it uh, within organs and tissues throughout the body. And again, it's made in the liver, same as uh, patients who have familial amyloidosis. So what about cardiac involvement? Uh, AL amyloidosis, if one does a cardiac biopsy, it will be positive in almost all cases, but the uh, significance is of variable uh, importance. In transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis, the familial type, um, the uh, cardiac deposition varies tremendously with mutation. So some forms, the phenotype is almost exclusively neuropathy, where others are almost exclusively cardiomyopathy. And senile cardiac amyloidosis, which again is also due to transthyretin uh, amyloidosis, is almost always isolated to the heart other than uh, the association with carpal tunnel syndrome. And this, for reasons that really are not clear, almost always occurs in elderly males. So why is it so challenging to diagnose cardiac amyloidosis? Well, first of all, the symptoms are often vague and they can be common and overlap with many of our other uh, diseases. So patients often present with exertional dyspnea, fatigue, chest pain. They can even present with acute coronary syndrome. They may have valvular heart disease. Atrial fibrillation is a common manifestation, particularly in patients with senile amyloidosis. Syncope, stroke, and conduction system disease all may occur. And many times patients, by the time they get diagnosed and present to a cardiologist, are, um, have developed overt heart failure. So delayed diagnosis is really a major factor in poor prognosis. And as cardiologists, we really need to try to make the diagnosis uh, earlier. So what are some of the clues that should really cause you to think about the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis? Well, first of all, if you have a patient with a dyspnea or heart failure who has unexplained weight loss, peripheral or autonomic neuropathy, unexplained uh, hepatomegaly, nephrotic syndrome, all of those things will make you think of cardiac amyloidosis. Well, here's a patient who presented when she was 55 years old with exertional dyspnea for the past two years. And I'm gonna tell you right off the bat that she has cardiac amyloidosis, but if you look at her echo, it doesn't look at all um, like what we would usually think to be cardiac uh, amyloidosis. So her wall thicknesses are normal. She has reduced uh, left ventricular ejection fraction and her right ventricular wall thickness were normal. But she did have some other clues to the diagnosis. And that was that her ECG showed a new uh, pseudo-infarct pattern, an anteroceptal infarct pattern, although there were no regional wall motion abnormalities on echo, and she had new low voltage. Her 24-hour urine showed proteinuria. She was hypotensive with exercise. And then to top it all off, she was going home to get a carpal tunnel release that had already been scheduled. So this patient had a lot of clinical clues to cardiac amyloidosis, even though her echo does not at all show us typical um, findings. So if you're the clinician, I want you just to think to yourself, what would you order? What uh, tests would you order to try to establish the diagnosis?
and sometimes that's a little bit confusing. But the important thing to remember is that you need to do a serum and urine immunoelectrophoresis, sometimes called monoclonal protein studies, not just a plain serum protein electrophoresis because that can miss the monoclonal protein. And importantly, we now also have serum-free light chains which are widely available. And if you do both of those things, uh, serum and urine, uh, immunoelectrophoresis, as well as serum-free light chains, you'll pick up 95 to 100% of the AL type of amyloid. Tissue diagnosis is mandatory in the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. So once you suspect the disorder, even if you have uh, abnormal monoclonal proteins and serum-free light chains, you have to get a tissue specim specimen from somewhere. Most commonly, we use a fat aspirate as a screening tool, and that will pick up the majority of patients with AL amyloid, but it's not as sensitive in the transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis, only about 20% of patients with senile cardiac amyloid. So in those cases, you may need to do a cardiac biopsy. So again, you can use fat aspirate, the bone marrow, particularly an AL uh, amyloid, and the importance is that you need to prove amyloid organ involvement and determine the type. Is this AL amyloid or is it, it transthyretin cardiac amyloid? And it's really fascinating that it's not all about wall thickening because I showed you this patient who has normal wall thickness, but she had very severe uh, heart failure due to cardiac amyloidosis, the AL type. And in fact, she underwent a heart transplant within six months. Yet one will see other uh, patients such as this. Here's a patient on the, on the right side of your screen who's walking three miles a day despite really severe wall thickening, septum measuring 28 millimeters or so. And this is a patient with senile cardiac amyloid. Amyloidosis. So we need to um, uh, realize what really causes organ dysfunction in amyloid. So we recognize that it is an infiltrative disorder, and here we see cardio, cardiac myocytes with amyloid fibrils and depositing in the extracellular space. So that's a traditional uh, mechanism of infiltrative um, cardiomyopathy, and that's certainly an important cause of heart failure and symptoms in the majority of these patients. So here we see that as more and more amyloid is deposited, the uh, cardiac cells uh, become distorted and uh, uh, displaced. However, it's interesting that direct toxicity of the light chains has been uh, proposed and has been uh, proven in animal models. So light chains and other prefibrillar proteins uh, cause oxidative stress and probably contribute significantly to cardiac dysfunction in the AL type of amyloid. So here in this schematic, we see the cardiac myocytes and immunoglobulin uh, proteins with the light chains, if you think of this in just a schematic fashion, kind of directly attacking the cardiomyocytes. And that probably explains for uh, the, the patient that we saw with normal wall thickness having such severe heart failure. Interesting that the ECG, there is really not that much written about it in cardiac amyloidosis. In a series that uh, we reviewed here of 127 patients with biopsy-proven cardiac involvement, low voltage and pseudoinfarct pattern were the most common uh, uh, manifestations in AL uh, amyloid. But notice that in, in transthyretin amyloid of the senile type, only 10% of patients had low voltage. So it's really important to recognize that uh, distinction. And ECG criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy was actually present in about 16% of patients who had AL amyloid. So normal voltage or even LVH criteria do not exclude the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. Many of you recognize that cardiac MRI has really aided in the diagnosis of this disorder due to diffuse late gadolinium enhancement and a characteristic pattern of difficulty nulling the myocardium. So cardiac amyloid um, can be detected by uh, cardiac MRI, and that's about 90% uh, sensitive and uh, specific. Well, what about treatment for cardiac amyloidosis? The hallmark is really to establish the amyloid type. So treatment varies um, uh, tremendously depending on what type of amyloid is present. And fortunately, there are expanding treatment uh, options. For AL amyloid, we have autologous stem cell uh, treatment uh, transplantation as well as uh, a whole variety of chemotherapeutic uh, regimens.
For the senile and familial amyloid uh, patients, there are trials starting of molecules that stabilize transthyretin or actually prevent its formation, therefore preventing uh, fibril formation. And familial um, uh, patients with transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis uh, can also be treated with uh, liver transplantation. And in very selected patients of any type, we actually do consider cardiac transplantation, ventricular assist device, total artificial um, heart has been used in some patients as a bridge to transplant, and again, these are all in highly selected patients. As far as cardiac-specific care, we really are limited to supportive care, diuretics, sometimes a pleurex catheter for uh, recurrent pleural effusions, very important to educate the patient and their family and make sure they understand which type of cardiac amyloid they have because the prognosis is so different. And um, things such as atrial fibrillation can be very challenging to manage. We need to make sure that we realize that patients with very restrictive um, hemodynamics often will need a higher heart rate. And if we lower that excessively, they will often have worsening heart failure. They're very challenging because these are very sick patients and sometimes uh, we are left with end-stage heart failure. And interestingly, although for years digoxin has been felt to be contraindicated in cardiac amyloid, that's actually based on very little scientific uh, evidence. And it actually might be preferable to things such as beta uh, blockers and calcium channel blockers. But if you do use digoxin, uh, use it in low dose and make sure you monitor the trough level and keep that uh, low. Really important for patients with AL cardiac amyloidosis for cardiologists to realize that beta blockers uh, as well as ACE inhibitors and ARBs almost always have no role in the management of these patients and many times their heart failure worsens significantly. So don't use those medications in patients especially with AL unless you have a very good reason because most of the time they have normal ejection fraction so these agents are not indicated. And when we lower heart rate and lower their blood pressure, especially as they often have autonomic uh, uh, dysfunction, they do very uh, poorly. So here's a quick question just to ask yourself. If one looked at patients with autopsies, um, how many patients with uh, AL amyloid would have an intracardiac uh, thrombus? You can kind of just think about what the answer might be there. So interestingly, um, we have found that patients with uh, amyloidosis, even in sinus rhythm, can develop large intracardiac thrombi. And in a Mayo study of 108 uh, patients where we had autopsy hearts available, here we saw a very large uh, thrombus in the left atrial appendage extending into the left atrium. And we found that 51% of patients with AL amyloid uh, had intracardiac thrombus, even though only 17% of them were in atrial fibrillation. And in the senile and familial types, thrombus was not as common. It was 17%, even though they had a higher burden of atrial fibrillation. So the take home po point for this is that if you have a patient with atrial fibrillation and you're considering elective cardioversion, it's really not recommended to do that without uh, a transesophageal echo to exclude clot first and with uh, concomitant anticoagulation. What about cardiac arrest in amyloidosis? Well, especially in patients with the AL type, uh, despite advances in treatment, mortality within the first year still remains at 50%. And the vast majority of these deaths are due to sudden uh, a cardiac death. And interestingly, it's been reported that often these are due to a pulseless electrical activity. There have been patients who have been successfully resuscitated uh, due to malignant ventricular arrhythmias, and some patients have sudden death due to bradyarrhythmias. But uh, increasingly, there are reports that these patients are dying due to pulseless electrical activity. And um, so the role of ICD is really uh, questionable and debatable at this uh, uh, point. So here's a patient who actually had had previous cardiac arrest and had a defibrillator place. But here you see that he has a paced ventricular rhythm at the time that he happened to have a Holter on when he had uh, cardiac arrest due to pulseless electrical activity. And he did not uh, survive. So why should we diagnose cardiac amyloidosis? I mean, does it really matter? Well, here's a, 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 a patient who had autologous stem cell transplant due to AL cardiac amyloid. And here you'll see that when she presented, she had class three to four heart failure and she had classic echo features, uh, thickened walls, severe diastolic dysfunction. Um, on her echo, and 
uh, three years after her stem cell transplant, her echo was essentially normal. Normal wall thickness, normal diastolic function, and she's actually alive 13 years uh, later. So very important to establish the diagnosis. And in summary, as cardiologists and as internists, what do we need to know about uh, cardiac amyloidosis? Well, first of all, there's a very diverse presentation and the imaging findings can be quite diverse. Classic amyloidosis is easy to recognize, but the variants are not so simple. Normal voltage or even criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy does not exclude the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. And the amyloid type uh, is crucial in determining the treatment options and the prognosis. So be careful if you see a patient with amyloid. Senile amyloid is not at all the same as AL amyloid and has a much better prognosis. Be really cautious in using beta blockers or ACE inhibitors or ARBs in these patients unless you have a very well-defined uh, indication. Don't cardiovert them unless you've had a transesophageal echo, um, unless it happens to be an emergent cardioversion. And there are some really uh, exciting trials on the horizon for patients with familial and senile amyloidosis. And the latter particularly had been mostly an academic diagnosis up until now, but uh, we are going to have uh, trials available in the near future for these um, individuals. So many have um, compared amyloidosis to the um, great masquerader. It's kind of the tuberculosis of our era. And as clinicians, we need to really have a heightened uh, index of suspicion to uh, diagnose this disorder and also to take off our blinders and recognize all the various forms uh, in which it may present. So delayed diagnosis is a major factor in poor prognosis, and we need to make the diagnosis earlier. Thank you for your attention.